So, if it wasn't clear what happened before, the soldier went and opened the woman's cell first, though if you watch the radar, it kind of seems like she opened it somehow? See? It looks like she's much closer to it than the guard was, so how did it get open? I've got two theories, they're both as likely as each other at this point. Theory one is that she manipulated and or seduced the guy into coming over and either unlocking her door or giving her the key. I mean, you've got two prisoners, both of which are making a loud noise, but only one of them kind of sounds like they're dying, and it's clearly coming from the high priority VIP that you've already had to yell at for apparently talking to themselves in the last five minutes. Shut up in there, will ya? But then you open her door first? And then she's able to get close enough to beat the shit out of him, even though he has the advantage over her? This is all only drawing on inference, of course, but Johnny here being a massive horn dog is a solid explanation for what could have happened. And that woman is built all right. Theory two is that she's Hulk strong and mangled open the lock on the door before beating down the dude who was too intimidated to do anything in the face of such overwhelming strong. She is pretty built after all. In either case, she opened our cell and that's how Snake, legendary mercenary, was jumped by someone he'll soon casually describe as a rookie only a few seconds into the next conversation. Although he's not wrong. She first mistakes him for Liquid and nearly loses her advantage over Snake while distracted. Snake points out her hands are shaking and drops some of his hard-earned battlefield wisdom. Can you shoot me, rookie? Careful. I'm no rookie. Liar. That nervous glance. That scared look in your eyes. They're rookies' eyes if I ever saw them. You've never shot a person, am I right? It's as though the things that Steven Seagal thinks he can do were actually made manifest in a person. The fact that she's just come from a POW situation, wrestling a gun from a warden while unarmed herself, before performing an impressive feat of quick change has no bearing on this situation whatsoever. From just a glance at small details, like hands shaking and the deep, soul-bearing expression of your eyes, Snake can deduce not only your capability for murder, but aspects of your personal history. Snake basically has crime vision. You haven't even taken the safety off. Wait, seriously? Then what the fuck are you doing, Snake? You could have taken her down instead of being a condescending prick. Though, I mean, considering what she was implied to have done earlier with the door, then yeah, I can see why you wouldn't want to try physically attacking her. You know, battlefield allegiances being what they are, you also don't want to just outright kill her either in case she's a potential ally. So what I'm really saying, Snake, is why are you overlooking the tactical advantages that come with inflicting leg wounds? And then somehow, somehow, we'll get there, don't worry, a bunch of soldiers outside knew about what was going on and then burst in ready to kill us. Don't think, shoot! Surprise! I'm not gun shy. I'm telling you, shoot! And neither is she anymore, apparently. Look at her go! Let's stop here for a moment and talk about how this game actually controls. For the entirety of my playthrough, I played using the D-pad, and that's fine because by the time Metal Gear Solid was released, the DualShock hadn't even been out for a full year yet, so it's likely the game would have been designed with the D-pad in mind for controls. And while it might feel less precise than what you're perhaps used to in modern games, you still have eight directional movement, and it doesn't feel bad to play while using the D-pad. Except for aiming. Trying to manually aim will usually end up with you moving when you don't want to, or it pulls Snake shots off center, which means it takes more shots to kill enemies, and that's if you don't make Snake just swing wildly around so he's liable to hit. Hey wait, what happens if I shoot her? Nothing? Hmm, fine. To compensate for this, Snake auto aims, which is to say, as long as you have a weapon equipped and are looking vaguely in the direction of an enemy, pressing the fire button while not moving will have Snake lock onto that enemy. So instead of this, it's more like this. It's maybe not as big a problem as it seems, since the idea of gameplay is to avoid situations where you need to shoot your way out, and there are only a handful of situations where you're forced to do exactly that, but this is going to come back up again later, and we'll talk more about it then. For now, when all the enemy soldiers have been cleared out, the mystery woman immediately takes off, and Snake bolts after her so he can stare directly at her ass as she runs away. Wait. You know, considering how this all comes up again later, I'm doing Kojima a huge favor here by saying that the camera is just following Snake's point of view. Not that this is just a weird continuation of the way Kojima treats female characters. Except, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Anyway... Who are you? Yeah, it's, uh... 
It's a real fucking mystery. Didn't Campbell show you, like, a file photo or something? I think something about it reminded him of Gustavo, or maybe Holly, because Snake then PTSD so hard he has someone else's flashback. You fool! You've killed him! We see Liquid Snake, an old dude, and some gas mask creeper all standing around what looks like the corpse of Donald Anderson, with Liquid chewing them out for killing Danderson. And the gas mask creep explaining that Danderson's metal shielding was too strong. Wait, hang on, but I thought Liquid laments that they'll never get the detonation code now, and gas mask creep has a Bulgic's cunning plan moment before Snake comes to. Our rookie friend makes it into the elevator, then proves how far she's come on the whole being afraid of shooting people thing by taking a few pot shots at Snake to cover her escape. Snake takes cover, and then this happens. Snake calls through to Naomi, asking if everything's working as it should be. Naomi, I just had some kind of hallucination. Is it from the- Memes? No, Snake. The Memes. They're functioning properly. So what was it? It must have been psychometric interference coming from Psychomantis, Foxhound Psychic. Oh, yeah, it must have been that? Yeah, so you probably thought a minute ago that I was just using a throwaway, uninspired descriptor when I went with creep. No, no, this BDSM hobbyist and World War One enthusiast is Psychomantis. These are the practiced, unsettling words of someone who has done some unspeakable things. And through psychometric interference, he astrally projects into the room to perv on Meryl and Spook Snake. I could only assume he sensed that someone within a 50 mile radius of him was being sleazy and not to be outdone, instantly teleported into the room to drop some pickup lines that make my dick pucker before just disappearing again. Fucking hell, are you related to Running Man? Think of it as a mental feedback loop. So that was Mantis. Yeah, thanks Naomi, that's very helpful. So that just lets him... Make you see whatever the fuck he wants. No elaboration, limits, or even a clarification on whether it's something you've seen, something he's seen, a memory from someone else, or if it's just something he's made up. Literally just images projected straight into your brain. Rad. I guess I'll just add that to the list of powers which so far also appear to include mind reading, teleportation, and some kind of levitation, possibly even full flight. I mean, it's unclear on which of the two it would be because we're in a confined environment, so he wouldn't have been able to reach his full-blown potential if he did have full flight, but I guess it really doesn't matter since the whole hijack your brain to force you to see things ability is already pretty fucking horrific, and I imagine would be enough to get the job done in most cases. That's right. If the terrorists get Baker's code, they'll be able to launch that nuke anytime they want. Yeah, they'll use Metal Gear to do it. Colonel, did you know they were conducting a military exercise here using Metal Gear? I didn't know. Really? From here, we go back into the elevator and head down to the second basement level. And while we're passing through, we're gonna pop into this room over here for some C4. There's no punching walls and seeing an exclamation mark appear over Snake's head anymore when you find a weak point. Such video game tropes and trappings were dropped in favor of realism, I guess, with the irony being that this game created one of the most prevalent video game memes ever with... Now, you just knock on walls and listen for the sounds that they make, with normal walls sounding like this... and hollow destructible walls sounding like this... This mechanic of using explosives to access sealed off areas isn't something that comes up very often throughout the game, and I think this might be the only time it's required for progression. Given how sparingly it's used, I can't decide if this was just put in as a callback to Metal Gear 2 or not, especially when in a sneaking game where explosions will alert the enemy and there just aren't a lot of other uses for the C4. All of that said, just like Metal Gear 2, you still punch the air to detonate explosives like it's the greatest joy that you have in life. So you walk into the room and there's an old man stood in the middle of some kinky rope play and I'm starting to have different questions about these terrorists. But as Snake approaches, the old dude gets all worked up about it, moaning and such, so you know, he must be pretty excited for this. No, no, don't 
touch it. Yeah, okay, you know, that's fair. We haven't even discussed the safe word yet. Turns out the wires are all linked to C4 charges, because I guess as you get older, you have to keep finding weirder, kinkier stuff to keep chasing that feeling as everything else becomes stale. Snake dodges a bullet. Literally, jumping several feet in the air from a standing start before a Russian cowboy comes walking out from behind a pillar to confront you. Welcome to the new standards for Metal Gear weirdness, friends. So you're the one that the boss keeps talking about. Oh bullshit, you don't know exactly who this is. But we'll get to you and your whole weird deal in time. Yes, we will, you f fuck. Played by Patrick Lane, which sort of isn't his real name, this is... Revolver Ocelot. Remember this guy, forever. He's important, even if he doesn't seem like it right now. He's also a show-off, an arrogant dick who can't stop pumping his own trumpet. Possibly other people's as well, we'll get to that. And his personality ranges wildly from lovable scam to absolute bastard. If you call the colonel, he'll hand over to Naomi, who explains Ocelot as a cowboy fetishist with a penchant for spaghetti westerns, in case that was hard to tell. Oh, and he's a sadistic torturer. Former Spetsnaz, he was part of an elite SWAT team for Russia's tax agency. Yep, he later bounced around between Russian agencies, including joining the KGB and becoming bored with it because of the rigid structure, which I can only assume means that even the Russians were uncomfortable with his level of sadism. So naturally, he was picked up by Foxhound. The weapon Ocelot uses is reflective of his tendencies. The muzzle velocity of a bullet fired from a revolver is slower than one fired from an automatic. That's bad for you. The slower a gun's muzzle velocity, the more damage it does. That's because the bullet will tend to lodge in the body instead of going right through. Those kind of wounds take a long time to heal. Sometimes they never do. I think that's part of the reason he likes that gun. And even our resident weapons expert agrees that it's not being used for tactical reasons. He's using a single action army? The first model of that gun was made in 1873, over 130 years ago. Today, they're still being made in small numbers, but uh, that's just for collectors and such. Nobody uses them in combat anymore. So yeah, Ocelot's just out living his best life by making others as painful as possible, while also dressed as a cowboy. And people say that Kojima is weird. Now his claims about being a crack gunslinger are unexaggerated, and if you aren't familiar with the fight, then it might seem frustrating at first. The room is a big square, with the outer boundary of it being marked by these four pillars, in the center of which is Baker and the C4 trap set up by Ocelot. While you're running around the outside of the room, so is Ocelot, and when you reach line of sight with him, or get close to reaching line of sight, Ocelot will run the opposite direction from you. If you try to cross the yellow line and run through the center then... Obviously, you need line of sight to Ocelot to be able to shoot him, and firing through the middle can be risky. I mean, Baker is right there, and auto-aim is a bit dicky in tight situations like this. We've already failed part of one objective, let's not fuck up the entire thing by shooting the dude we're meant to be saving. As your support team will tell you, you should be waiting for Ocelot to reload. The biggest drawback to a revolver is the reload time. That's your chance. The biggest drawback to revolver-style handguns is reload time. That's your chance. But he fucking loves doing it because Ocelot isn't just a sadist, he's a sadomasochist. When he's reloading, he's not moving, and that's supposed to be your chance to get a shot or two at him. I love the reload. Ocelot doesn't need line of sight to hit you though. I understand the bullet shoots. Um, sure. That really just means that he'll shoot straight through the middle of the arena, or sometimes ricochet bullets off of walls to hit you because he's just that good, and probably also doesn't give a shit if he hits Baker or not. So the result is a deadly game of cat and mouse, with the life of a... Well, I wouldn't call him an innocent, for reasons we'll get into shortly, but with a third party's life on the line, for sure. If you let him go on long enough as well, you'll learn that Ocelot loves the sound of his own voice. Hiding won't help you. There's nothing like the feeling of slamming a long silver bullet into a well finished chain. I love the smell of cordial. You know, that sultry smell. Almost as much as... I love to read but for all his bragging and posturing, this fight really isn't that hard when you've been playing this game at least once a year, more or less, since you were a child. I mean, I've honestly played this game through in its entirety more times than I've seen some relatives, and I'm not even talking about the castle. I love to reload to
Don't you want to settle this? You're pretty good. Hmm, yeah, just soak that in. He does the cliched, I'm just getting warmed up shtick. But that's just the setup for an incoming plot device, brandishing a sword with which to cut off that tired line. Also Ocelot's hand. What? My hand? Oh, well fuck, I need him. Yeah, I think you might have the wrong person, sir, because I have several names. Also, this is the second time a ninja has shown up during the first boss battle of the game, and given what the game has been throwing at me so far, Kyle, is that you? Fuck, alright, it was just a question, cunt. Yeah, look, if you thought Running Man was weird, then buckle the fuck in, because we're just getting warmed up. Snake helps Baker up, who is inexplicably alive. Seriously, an explosion that big at that proximity could be enough to kill a healthy person, let alone an old dude that's fresh off of being tortured. Was it the coat? Is the coat explosive proof? Do I need to take the coat with me? He slumps Baker up against a nearby wall so he can pump him for info, but not in that way. I mean, the guy looks pretty tired. You explain to Baker that the terrorist got the DARPA chief's code and that you need to know what happened with his, to which Baker replies... Oh, I get it. Jim sent you. You're, you're from the Pentagon. Answer my question. Fuck. The explosion scrambled his brain. He reveals that he talked and that the terrorists now have his code, which means... Now the terrorists have both codes and can launch any time. They didn't read his mind, of course, because he had surgical implants that acted as psychic insulation. Everyone on this project has them, he says, including the DARPA chief, which is what I heard in that vision trip back in the prison area, so that tracks. But then Danderson himself told us that he had his codes extracted by Psychomantis, so what am I meant to believe? The unexplained hallucinations of unclear origins that told me his mental shielding was too strong, which is backed up by an old man that just had the bejesus tortured out of him? Or the ravings of the man himself, whose mind may have been broken when its safeguards were smashed, and his memories mined for information by a sadistic fuck who clearly enjoys hurting people while LARPing as Carl Cronin. Are you sure you heard him right? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, I mean, pretty sure. He said it once, and let's just say I didn't get a chance to ask many follow-up questions, and actually, better question, why didn't I get a mind shield implant? Instead, Baker talked off to some good old-fashioned torture, liberally applied to the arm, because that shit probably hurts like a motherfucker, and he'd never received training to resist physical torture. I never had any training on how to resist torture. Which, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Arms tech isn't a government department, it's just a civilian company that takes on government contracts. So not only would he not have received military training, but he's likely lived the soft, comfortable life of the ultra-wealthy. Breakfast served every day with caviar cigars brought to him by whichever wage slave is unfortunate enough to be in his vicinity at the time. You know, when I was a kid, I cared about this dude because I just saw him as a hostage and good guys rescue people in trouble. But wow, 23 years of life experience and widening economic disparity can really change how we look back on some things, huh? You know, Danison made some sense to try and rescue. Who knows what classified intel he had rolling around in his head, but this guy? He doesn't seem like he's bringing a lot to the table but money, and that's a role almost anyone can fill. This guy fucking knows someone, or is at least paying someone off, and that's why instead of rescuing any number of analysts, engineers, scientists, maintenance crews, factory laborers, admin staff, hospital staff, janitorial workers, or basically anyone that contributes to a functioning society, we're here rescuing this useless rich fuck. Baker talks about how he suffered at the hands of Ocelot, and Snake tries to lighten the mood. What happened to your arm? He broke it. Looks like you're more than even now. His was sliced off. Ha, huh. you're a funny man. You're damn right Snake's a funny guy. Maybe we should give him a hand? <laughs> Man, I'm glad I don't have robots that tase me for that shit. Snake lets Baker know that the DARPA chief is dead, and that doesn't go well. I can't be. You know, that's not what you promised, Jim. Now you want to shut me up? Oh. 
Snake tries to calm him down What's wrong with you? by telling him it was just a heart attack. Then Baker uses some old man words to call Snake an idiot, but doesn't elaborate on why because apparently we don't do that around here. He was probably too focused on viciously assaulting Snake with his cane. <laughs> Snake also asks if Baker's carrying the card keys from Metal Gear. To override the detonation code, I heard you had them. To which he replies that they're in the possession of a woman, a soldier who was taken into custody at the same time as him, and Snake is all... A female soldier, it must be. You should follow that instinct, Snake. Baker says she was a new recruit, imprisoned by the sons of Big Boss because she refused to join the revolution, and Snake deduces that this could be the Colonel's niece. Baker also says that he already knew that she'd escaped because he'd been in contact with her by codec, using one that the female soldier stole from a guard to give to Baker. That particular bit of info will become much more relevant later on, so let's just keep it in mind for now. Right now, though, he says you should call her for more information, and her frequency is... Oh yeah, let me tell you, it's... Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> that's funny, but wait for it. Oh, that's right. It should be on the back of the CD case. Yeah, this feels like another early DRM attempt, similar to the tap code thing from the last game, and I do have the case that I could go check, but jokes on you, game. I played this so often as a child that I've got that frequency memorized. Snake says he needs an alternate way to prevent the launch if the car keys don't work, and Baker tells you to seek out Hal Emmerich. Who's that? The team leader of the Metal Gear Rex project. A genius at engineering, but a little bit of an oddball. You bite your tongue, Baker. That's franchise royalty you're referring to. But yeah, he's not wrong. Snake asks why the terrorists are going after Metal Gear when the nuclear age ended at the turn of the millennium, and the response is another long cutscene laden with stock footage, the licensing of which would make the franchise even harder to play than it already would be in a couple of decades' time. And we'll talk about that another day. For now... I understand, but why Metal Gear? The nuclear age ended with the turn of the millennium. Oh, you're wrong. The threat of nuclear war isn't gone. In fact, it's greater than it's ever been. Spent nuclear fuel and plutonium, increasing a warehouse full of drums and drums and over your way to dispose. Close the lid and try to pretend. Yes, not even doing a good job, drums are corroded. Several pounds of muff every year. Muff. Muff. Muff? Muff. muff. Material unaccounted for. Large and organized black market since the end of the Cold War. Russian nuclear engineers out of work. Available nuclear material and scientists making a bomb. Any small country. Nuclear weapons program. Other superpowers. Complete impossibility to maintain deterrence. A weapon of overwhelming power. Metal Gear. Our industry suffered cuts in budgets due to peace. Mergers and takeovers. Company lost their bid. Metal Gear last ace in the hole. Black Project. Black Project. Secret paid for by the Pentagon to avoid red tape and bleeding hard oversight. Bribes. I prefer good business. Did you get all that? It's the grim reality, straight from the horse's mouth, but this is only confirming what we already knew from Nastasha. Spent nuclear waste is piling up, and for the sake of a fistful of dollars, it's being left wherever they think people won't see it, and consequences be damned. Also, he laments the peacetime people have generally been enjoying up to this point because of the budget cuts to military programs. To that end, Arms Tech lost their bid to produce the next generation of fighter jets, which meant that the Metal Gear project was their last gasp. Hell, with how bad things were going, maybe he thought the revolution from the Sons of Big Boss was actually a hostile takeover? Eh? Eh? You know, like how I said in the last episode? So Snake says he doesn't give a shit about Baker's company. I don't give a crap about you and your company. Good for you, Snake. Fuck this capitalist asshole. And Baker dismisses Snake as a grunt like the bougie dog he is. Then he hands Snake an optical disc with the Metal Gear test data on it, a level 2 access card, and then starts dropping some probably highly classified intel about the robot ninja, how he's a genetic experiment, and a dark secret of Foxhound. Dropping hints that Dr. Naomi knows more about it than she's letting on, and holy shit dude, are you supposed to just be telling me all this? He's not done either, saying how Metal Gear itself uses currently existing technology, but oh... Fuck, it's happening again. What? What did you do to me? Oh, no. Oh, oh no, it can't be. Those Pentagon bastards. So, they, they actually went in, did it. I mean, at least it's not exactly surprising why it's happening this time, right? They, they, they're just using you for...
okay. This is a lot to process and is laden with potential conspiracies. Naomi is clearly involved with the ninja, which is some kind of messed up experiment in a dirty foxhound secret. And that weird phrasing of currently existing technology around Metal Gear. The same phrasing used to describe Mei Ling's inventions. Also, let's not forget that people just keep having heart attacks when they start talking about sensitive information. Colonel, are you listening? Now he's dead too. I have no idea. The Colonel barely hides the fact that he knows more than he's letting on and tells you to work with Meryl, which I guess is confirmation that the female soldier is his niece. Which would be kind of confusing if you hadn't watched the full briefing because at no point is their relationship brought up in the game before this point, but that's fine because you did watch the full briefing. Right? 